Hello, I'm Dr. Louise Newson. I'm a GP and menopause specialist, and I'm also the founder of the Newson Health Menopause and Wellbeing Centre here in Stratford upon Avon. I'm also the founder of the Free Balance app. Each week on my podcast, join me and my special guests where we discuss all things perimenopause and menopause. We talk about the latest research, bust myths on menopause symptoms and treatments, and often share moving and always inspirational personal stories. This podcast is brought to you by the Newson Health Group, which has clinics across the UK dedicated to providing individualised perimenopause and menopause care for all women. A very important guest with me, someone from Italy um, who I have known for a little while, but he hasn't known me, I suppose. I've read a lot of his papers and had the privilege of meeting him face to face recently at a conference in Florence. So, Professor Marco Gambacciani is a professor um, and runs a menopause clinic in Italy and is very academic as well. So, it's a great pleasure to introduce you today. Uh, thank you for joining me, Marco. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really proud of it. Thank you very much. Oh, so I um, have read a lot of your work in the past. And as a physician, as you know, I'm not a gynecologist. I am very interested in science and I'm very interested in pathology. And I'm very interested in the way our hormones work all over our body. And when I uh, heard you talk in Florence recently, you were talking about heart disease as well. Um, and you also were talking about how uh, there's a lot of interest in the UK and there's a lot happening in the UK and other countries need to learn from what we're doing over here. And yeah. I was really interested because I every day feel that we're not doing enough and I don't feel I'm doing enough. And I feel like in the UK, we're not doing enough. We're denying so many women of evidence-based treatment. And it then I, when I was sitting there, I thought, yes, you're right. We are doing well, but we're not doing well enough. But it doesn't it show how badly other countries are doing. And there's 30 million women in Italy and only the minority of them are taking HRT. So yeah. I'm really keen before we go into that. Can I just ask you a bit about your background and how you got to working in menopause? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Starting from scratch, I had my thesis on PCOS syndrome. And therefore, when uh, I got my degree, I thought to be entitled to start working on PCOS. But my boss, and you, you know, in Italy, we don't, uh, uh, we don't say no to our bosses. And, uh, and the boss said, Marco, you are going to run uh, the uh, uh, menopause clinic with a doctor, uh, and uh, I was really disappointed. And uh, Professor Fioretti saw my face and he asked me, "Why, Marco, you are so upset about my decision that you are going to be the menopause guy of our group?" Because you know, I had my thesis in PCOS, and, my, and uh, Professor Fioretti told me, "Marco, think." that in 20 years, the vast majority of our women, they are going to be menopausal. So you are going to be the expert in a field that is going to be the most important in, the, in gynecology. I was thinking about that for ages, <laughs> for months, and uh, actually it was right. And I have to thank him. To, for for his decision, because since then I was interested the first in the symptoms. We were doing some work also on neuroendocrinology of uh, hot flashes, and uh, I studied the hot flashes also following the Professor Yen studies in, back in the seventies and the early eighties, conducted in La Jolla in California. I was uh, with him for three years uh, working on uh, neuroendocrine regulation of uh, hypothalamus, hypothalamus pituitary axis. And uh, afterwards, I was interested also in, in um, cardiovascular disease, lipid changes around the time of menopause, 
and definitely osteoporosis. We were the first gynae clinic in Italy to have a bone densitometer. At that time, we were using the bone densitometry in the heart, like Bob Lindsay did the beautiful data, beautiful work, and uh, he, uh, he gave us a seminal data uh, on bone density after a variectomy, m- measuring bone density at the wrist. And uh, I was fascinated by those work, by those data, and that we try to repeat and uh, to replicate this data, uh, treating women with the different uh, compounds rather than mestranol, like Bob did at that time. And, uh, yeah. And afterwards, after menopause, after osteoporosis, uh, we were starting doing some work also on vulvovaginal atrophy. Okay. This is in summary my background. It's very interesting because when I opened my menopause clinic over here four and a half years ago, one of the first things I did was to get a DEXA machine, a bone density machine for the clinic. And I opened my clinic with just a bank loan. I didn't have any money. And my finance director said, that's crazy. Why are you buying a bone density machine? And I said, because I feel very strongly that every woman, but actually probably every man as well, (laughs) should have a bone density scan. And where I worked before at the hospital, I'd persuaded the chief exec to um, rent a a DEXA scan. We had a, a, a van that came once a week when I was doing my clinic. And I encouraged a lot of women to have bone density scans then. And it was mad because there were orthopedic surgeons, there were rheumatologists working at the clinic with me, but none of them referred for a DEXA scan. But quite a few women uh, did go to the DEXA scan and I picked up a lot of osteoporosis actually in asymptomatic women who'd never had a fracture. Um, Some of them had had a family history of osteoporosis. And so when I opened the clinic, I called it a menopause and well-being center, didn't even call it a clinic because I want people to think in a very holistic way how they can help. So hormones are part of it, but actually it's looking at our bone density is so important because osteoporosis is more common than heart disease. It's more common than breast cancer. It's more common than dementia, yet we don't talk about it. And as a physician, I've done a lot of rheumatology jobs and as a GP, I've gone to a lot of people in nursing homes and people who are housebound who have osteoporosis of the spine and they're in pain. They can't digest food properly because of the curvature of their spine. They can't uh, breathe properly because they can't inflate their lungs because their, their their spine is curved. They can't hug their grandchildren because every time they do, they get pain or a fracture. And you're nodding, so I know you've seen yes. similar women. Yet I, we don't I... talk about it. And once we have it, it's so much harder to treat. Like lots of things in medicine, it's better to prevent than to treat. Um, So awareness is the most important thing before you even think about how to prevent. It's just knowing. So having a DEXA machine, looking at bone density, which is a gold standard, as you know, for diagnosing osteoporosis, looking at osteopenia, is really important. But it's hard, isn't it, when people think about hormones as affecting fertility or affecting periods? Yeah. How do our hormones even get into our bones, and why should we? Why should we be thinking in this way? I cannot agree more with you because you know something that I didn't tell you yet that I became uh, uh, fascinated by the effects of hormones on uh, on bone just because my grandmother. In the early 30s, after the, li- the delivery of my uncle, she got a, a, an hemorrhagia, a, a tremendous hemorrhagia. And at that time, was uh, fashionable to treat everything with uh, the X-rays in the, in the 30s. Mm. And she got the Rangan therapy on the pelvis to block the bleeding. And she became menopausal in their early, in the late 20s. My grandmother, she was a, a very well, uh, a, 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 she was a, a healthy woman, but 
She got a tremendous osteoporosis. She, she spent the last 20 years of her life in bed or chair. Oh, gosh. That's, that's what well, she was terrible. She was breaking her bones, <laughs> you know, just uh, lifting my daughter. Mm. And therefore, I cannot agree more with you. Who, whom, a woman must, must have a bone scan around the time of menopause. If this is okay, we can repeat the bone scan after two years, three years, five years, or whatever. But I, I, I completely agree with you. And that time, we can identify a lot of women that are osteopenic. And there are data showing that the vast majority of women that are going to have uh, bone fractures are those that they are aware of stepenic, maybe five, ten years before. And then we can really prevent. Measuring bone density at 65, I like uh, in the National Health Service in Italy, they recommend. It's like to measure blood pressure in a ictus center, in a stroke center. Yes. They already have the, the disease, so why should I should have uh, be concerned? I should be concerned about blood pressure. They already had the stroke. Mm -hmm. And the same is, is measuring the bone density at 65 or 70. They already had the fractures. Because you know that the, the postmenopausal osteoporosis was defined by the decrease in the yeah. height of the women just because they had the, the small fractures in their bones, in their vertebras. Mm. And Fuller Albright demonstrated that just, measure, just measuring the height of the women without any scans, any bone or density, you know, just measuring the fact that the women after menopause decrease in their height just because the... the the vertebra crashes. Yes. And not only the vertebra, we demonstrated also, and Mark Brinkat, uh, that is a fellow of the, uh, the British Menopause Society, and he was the head of the Mo Malta uh, uh, OBGYN department, uh, he demonstrated, uh, and we, we, we were both demonstrated in the same years that after menopause, you have the decrease also in the height of intervertebral discs. Intervertebral discs. And a short shock absorber it was not the Nike inventing the shock absorber for the shoes. The, it was the our God that they invented the, the shock absorbers in between the two different uh, uh, um, vertebra. And the, in the postmenopausal women losing the estrogen and losing a lot of water and the good uh, collagen in their body. They lose also the height in the in, in the intervertebral disc. And this one is one other risk factor for vertebral fractures in postmenopausal women. Yeah, and I it's mean, so the the, it, the bone is something that the, the gynecologist must be con, must be concerned. Uh, the bone health is something that we have need to be concerned around the time of menopause. Absolutely. And we know the longer a woman is without her hormones, the greater the risk. So I don't know the exact figures. No one does. But it's around 3% of women under the age of 40 have an early menopause. And we see a lot of women in my clinic who have had an oophorectomy. They've had both their ovaries removed, yet they've never been given hormone replacement. And they've had their ovaries removed in their sometimes their 20s, their 30s. And so they'll have longer without hormones. And obviously that means they might experience symptoms, but whether they have symptoms or not, they've still got these bone changes which aren't being addressed, which sure. is a real concern. And we work out of the NICE guidance, the NICE menopause guidance, as you know, was produced seven years ago now. And we've got the International Menopause Society guidance that came out in 2016. And they do show that there is evidence that... Um, giving HRT to reduce fragility fractures. So these are the fr fractures that occur at low impact, usually due to osteoporosis. Um, yet most rheumatologists, most osteoporosis specialists in the UK will never recommend HRT or prescribe HRT. What's it like in Italy? 
It's the same. It's, it's the same. And, uh, you know, the internists, rheumatologists, endocrinologists, are not uh, um, familiar with uh, the HRT prescription. They don't know, they don't know how to deal with the bleedings. They don't know how to deal with uh, breast tensions. Uh, they don't know how to bleed in general with women complaints. Just, just, they just say that the hot flesh is something that are natural to have. Don't worry. Uh, everything is going to be all right in a couple of months or a year. Don't take all this stuff that it causes cancer and uh, clots and uh, is, is very dangerous treatment and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, yes, we lose the possibility to prevent the vast majority of fractures. And if you, you know that the North American Menopause Society Release the the uh, a recommendation for the uh, uh, osteoporosis prevention and treatment. Mm. Clearly, saying that the hormones are the most effective uh, 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 um, agents able to prevent and treat peri and postmenopausal women because there are no data showing the bone-specific agents like bisphosphonates are working in women under 50. Mm. Nevertheless, a lot of physicians, they prescribe bisphosphonates in, primar in premature menopausal women, or they prescribe hormones for a couple of years, and after they stop, no matter uh, how old is, 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 the, is the woman. Last week, I saw a 47 uh, yeah, old woman. She was menopausal. She went through the menopause around the time of around the 39, 40. She got the five years hormone replacement therapy, and after hormone replacement therapy was stopped for the fear of breast cancer, and she got a terrible, uh, terrible uh, uh, hot flashes, nice, nice sweats, and so on and so forth. But in a couple of years, they she lost 5% of bone density at the, at, on the spine. And this is the results of, uh, this is one of the results of uh, the poor uh, cultural level of our colleagues out there about the timing of HRT and the treatment of premature menopause, but they should say the treatment of menopause at all, you know, yeah. And it seems the women the same, are suffering from that. Well, it, it totally, and it seems the same globally, which is incredibly frustrating. And recently, Rebecca Lewis, one of my colleagues who you met actually in in uh, Italy, had lectured at the British Society of Rheumatology about um, bones and menopause. And actually, there was a lot of interest, and a few rheumatologists afterwards said, "How do we learn how to prescribe HRT?" And I didn't know it was safe. I didn't know there was no clot risk when it's through the skin. And I didn't know the risk of breast cancer, if it is there, is so low anyway. And they also then have been saying, well, what about women with fibromyalgia? We see a lot of people with fibromyalgia and perhaps yeah. we should be considering hormones for them as well. And obviously we're talking about estrogen, but also testosterone for women is probably likely to help with bone density and muscle strength as well. And the muscles that support our bones it's really important that they're strong as well, isn't it? Sure, sure. Uh, sarcopenia and osteoporosis is, are, are parallel uh, uh, syndromes in our, uh, as we age, both male and female. We do have uh, both sarcopenia and osteoporosis. And definitely hormones, particularly estrogen and testosterone, are uh, very important uh, both in men and women. Uh, to support the bones, joints, muscles, and so on and so forth, and the collagen in general, yeah. you know? And therefore, uh, I think that we need uh, to, to have discussion, interactions with uh, the rheumatologist. I am a lucky guy. I have a friend of mine. She's a rheumatologist. Uh, she's interested in, uh, in fibromyalgia. And... Uh, she sent me a lot of patients suffering from fibromyalgia that are in uh, decreasing their quality of life for the symptoms of fibromyalgia around the time of menopause. And we definitely, we treat them with hormones. 
those kind of patients I do prefer to, to use uh, uh, transdermals, always transdermals, because sometimes they do have some uh, problems uh, that can increase uh, also the blood clot risks. And, and, and therefore, in those kind of patients, I usually prescribe, uh, even without any evidence uh, of uh, uh, need to to be uh, uh, prescribing, just to prescribe the transdermas. I prefer, I'm more confident in prescribing uh, transdermas and those patients. Yeah, and, and to be honest, certainly in our practice, in my clinic, um, we usually prescribe transdermal first line actually for all women because it's easier to tailor the amount according to their individual needs, to titrate the dose according to their symptoms. Sure. Um, and obviously there's no clot risk as well, which is also beneficial, especially as people get older. So when I'm comparing, when I was younger as a junior doctor, we used to prescribe a lot of bisphosphonates um, without really thinking about how difficult they were to um, take because you have to be sitting upright, you have to not eat for a certain length of time, they can cause side effects. Um, I used to write them up a lot because my consultant told me to, but actually they, they might help some women. Obviously, we know um, reducing risk of osteoporotic fractures, but that's about all they'll do. Whereas if we think about HRT, we know that it will help improve bone density. We know it will reduce risk of osteoporosis and strengthen bones. But it also has other beneficial effects to our sure. body as well, doesn't it? So um, our, the biggest killer of women globally is heart disease, cardiovascular disease and dementia. They're sort of running closely together. It depends on what you read, whether it's cardiovascular disease or dementia. Um, and cardiovascular disease is far more common. In fact, the only menopause training I had in retrospect as a student was a um, physiology lecture where they said, women are protected against heart disease until the age of 50. And then yeah. the protection goes and they, their risk increases. When women have a heart attack over the age of 50, they're more likely to die, less likely to have typical symptoms, um, and what a shame for women. But no one mentioned the word oestrogen or hormones. They just no. said age 50. And it set alarm bells, and I've got quite an inquisitive mind. So I said to my husband, because I met my husband when I was 18, and we always sat next to each other in lecture theatres, I said, Paul, that doesn't make sense. This, it's not a birthday present that we get when we're 50. There must be something happening in our bodies. And then the year after that lecture, I did a pathology degree and I learned a lot more about hormones and about our immune system and about inflammation and the inflammatory diseases, of course, which osteoporosis is one, but also is cardiovascular disease and dementia. Yeah and diabetes, and clinical depression, and schizophrenia, and Parkinson's disease. And without oestrogen, we get pro-inflammation, so our bodies don't sure. work so well. We've known for decades, really, haven't we, Marco, that the longer a woman is without her hormones, the greater the risk of heart disease, the greater the risk of dementia, the, the greater the level of um, LDL cholesterol, which is the so-called bad cholesterol, we know this for many years, yet the evidence regarding what about taking HRT to reduce those risk of diseases is quite clouded because we've been looking at lots of different types of HRT and lots of different groups of women and people tend to group everything together and we can always skew data. We can always um, make it very, very complicated and messy so then the results maybe suit what we need. But we do have evidence, don't we, that taking HRT reduces future risk of cardiovascular disease. Sure. But yeah, you are completely right. But what is this astonishing is that uh, when they say, cardiologists say, yes, women are protected uh, till the time of menopause and afterwards and so on, and blah, 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 they never pronounce the word estrogens. Mm -hmm. And uh, also in the JAMA, uh, uh, a few a few weeks ago, they published the 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 the, the 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 guideline for the prevention of chronic disease and so on and so forth. They were describing cardiovascular disease in women. They were describing the fact that, that the women, uh, but they say hormone replacement. That uh, they don't say replacement. They say hormone therapy. Uh, we should discuss also about definitions. Uh, hormone therapy. Hormone therapy is not indicated for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. I mean, saying exactly, exactly the opposite 
of what they were saying a few uh, paragraphs ab mm. above, you know. It's, it's unreasonable, uh, completely unreasonable. And yes, you are right. All these chronic diseases are, dise are inflammatory. The low-grade inflam inflammation that we have in our bodies as we age, you know, can be counteracted at least in part by hormones, and particularly in women, by estrogens. And we need to keep an eye on, on androgens because uh, I saw a, a beautiful study a beautiful study published uh, uh, last week uh, in the, the EPIC study uh, with a subgroup of women and uh, men that they were measuring, they were measuring uh, uh, over the years the DHA levels. And the women and men with a very low levels of DHA, they are at higher risk of cancer and they are at higher risk of, of uh, cardiovascular disease. But also, Subjects with very high levels of DHA are at risk of uh, cancer and cardiovascular disease. So the curve is a U-shaped curve. And the best uh, is around 200. So also prescribing uh, uh, this, this supplement uh, containing DHA as they were completely safe, uh, complete. I, I'd rather be concerned, uh, as we should be concerned every time we prescribe hormones. Absolutely. Hormones are very powerful. And therefore, if we know hormones, we know how to prescribe. Uh, but I, I like uh, the, 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 the possibility to discuss with my patient uh, the, the risks the benefits by always says don't take the uh, Google uh, uh, the Google uh, advices uh, and don't buy those uh, supplements on Amazon because uh, they can be risky or the best Absolutely. yeah the vast majority of of, of, uh, of of cases they don't do anything I mean they just is a waste of money yeah but I mean they certainly... can be also risky. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We see a lot of people that buy all sorts of things over um, the internet and often you've got no idea what they are. And I certainly in our in our clinic, and I'm sure the same, is all I do is, is replace to a physiological level. So we're just replacing or, or, or when they're perimenopausal, we're just topping it up, really. So testosterone... Sorry to interrupt you. This is the concept of HRT, <laughs> why the R must be there. You are completely right. I'm fighting to have the definition HRT rather than HT, that in, in uh, on the libraries, HT means hypertension, non hormone yeah. therapy. Yeah, sorry interrupting you, but no. you are completely right. Completely you're, you're, right. You're absolutely right. And it's so important because people seem to be very scared of hormones. And it's the same with any other medication. If I was giving someone a blood pressure lowering medication, I would change the dose according to their blood pressure and get them into a nice normal level. And then with time, actually, I used to spend a lot of time reducing blood pressure medication because often people would exercise more, they would eat better, they might lose weight, they might drink less alcohol. And so we're constantly adjusting doses of medications. That's what we do as physicians. And it's the same with hormones. We can start at one dose and then we might change, but we just keep it in the normal female range. Um, but allowing people to... Um, improve their symptoms but for me especially is optimizing their future health so we've got the usa telling us um you say this recent paper that was in JAMA that we wrote a letter um as a response to actually um saying that there isn't enough evidence to recommend hrt for primary prevention of any diseases when i've done work with nhs england they've again said there isn't enough evidence and I've said to them, well, I don't think you've read the papers properly. And I get into trouble for talking like that. But actually, there is evidence, um, good evidence, actually, especially when you're looking at heart disease and osteoporosis. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Because uh, all the data show, uh, showing uh, the effects of uh, hormone replacement in young women, and let's say so also, in young symptomatic women in their 50, they 
all of them are demonstrating the reduction of osteoporosis and fracture, the reduction of blood pressure levels, control, better control of blood pressure, better control of lipids, better control of glucose tolerance, a better control of everything that is related to the increase in chronic diseases, mm. mainly osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease. When you start hormones after 60, like they did in the WHI, you lose the opportunity to prevent. Maybe you are effective uh, on those women that still have symptoms, but definitely in a 65 years old woman, she already developed osteoporosis and therefore the risk of fracture. You, you already developed the risk of cardiovascular disease. And so with hormones, you, you cannot prevent after 65, what you can prevent when uh, you are treating a yeah. women I, around I mean, the it's, time. It's certainly, certainly the earlier we start HRT, the better. Um, we do see quite a few women who have missed out on HRT for various reasons um, and come to us when they're older. But even a low dose of estrogen can help improve their bone density for some people. Yeah, for, that's and, for sure. And also we've seen people lose... You know, their blood pressure is reduced. They've been able to lose weight. For some women, it means they don't have pain in their joints and they can go out and walk or they sleep better. And we know if you sleep better, your no disease improves, doesn't it? No doubt. But the best is to mm. start around the time of menopause. And you prolong the beneficial effects of endogenous estrogens that unfortunately are not pro produced anymore. And you prolong the beneficial effects of, of hormones on human's body. And this is important not only for quality of life, but also for disease prevention. I hope to have a, pre, a, 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 a meeting with uh, our new government. And I hope that they are going to be uh, 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 listening to the uh, needs of women the day we are, I mean, the ambassadors of women or women's needs. And uh, as ambassador, we need to underline that uh, menopause clinic must be all over the U Italy. Uh, I will, I should say so. And, uh, and, uh, uh, already, uh, and the medications that can help women, first of all, must be available be mm. because not only in the UK, I saw the, the problem of uterogestan uh, mm. uh, 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 availability in, in your country. But in Italy, it's the same. We, a lot of different products are not available, are registered, but are not available. And therefore, uh, for women, is a problem. Also because it's a problem. Because if I prescribe, let's say, Bijuba, one, one, one. Okay. And the woman goes to the pharmacy. And she asked for Bijuva. And the pharmacist says, no, it's not available anymore. It's not available. They don't produce anymore. The idea, the general idea is that, that first of all, the product is not a good product. It's not helpful. Because it's not produced. It's not distributed. It's something that is uh, meaningless for... Uh, Humans, for, for women, for women's health. Otherwise, it, would, it, it should be there. It should be in the pharmacy. And therefore, we must fight also to have the pharmaceutical companies to have the products as a licensed in the market mm, in absolutely. order to be able to prescribe and to be sure that when you are prescribing something, Women are going to find it. Otherwise, the general idea we can generate is that what we are prescribing is meaningless, is, is not important. It, that's a, a lot of women, they gave, they told me, Dr. Gambacciani, if they don't have it, it means that it's not important. Why are you deprescribing me? Yes. 
And it's not good as a physician to have women asking you something like a, a question like that, you know. It's embarrassing, you know. I totally you, agree. Need to, you need to explain. Yeah. I totally agree. And um, you know, certainly there's quite a few people over here that just think HRT is a lifestyle drug where we just want nice hair and good skin. They don't think about the importance. So I'm very grateful for your time today to help me unpick some of the evidence and be clear about the disease preventative effects of HRT, especially when started in younger women. Before we finish, I always ask for three take-home tips. So I'd really like you to give me three reasons why women should consider HRT when they're younger to reduce their risk of disease. I think that the major reason is to improve their quality of life to reduce the symptoms, because reducing the symptoms, it has been demonstrated that there are all evidence-based medicine there to, to, to support the fact that when we are reducing the symptoms and improving the quality of life, we, we also do a good prevention of chronic disease. This is the major, the major, uh, uh, problem in, 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 uh, and the second reason is that in, in improving the quality of life, you improve your performances. Usually today, a woman around 50, she's a, she's a worker and she is in the, in the top of her career. And uh, she has why she has to lose opportunities just because she's flashing and she's not sleeping well. Is it foolish? And the third uh, major concern is the sex. Women, they need to maintain the, uh, the possibility to have enjoyable sex. And definitely with uh, the low estrogen levels around her, her body, a woman has a low sexual desire, poor vaginal performances, and that there are no reasons to wait to the dyspareunia to treat women and maintain uh, the vaginal functions. So I think that the woman, they must uh, be treated uh, when we can treat women with HRT for her, their symptoms, preventing the chronic disease and in maintaining an enjoyable sexual life. All sounds very good. So I very much agree with everything that you said and I'm very grateful for your time today and I look forward to seeing you again in Italy or welcoming you over here to UK. So thanks again for your time today, Marco. Thank you, Luis. You can find out more about Newson Health Group by visiting www.newsonhealth.co.uk and you can download the free Balance app on the App Store or Google Play.